Well, good morning, Walden Church. Thanks for being here. It's so great to see all of you here this morning. We are going to continue taking a break from Revelation. <laughs> and so I was trying to think, uh, like, what could we do? What could we learn for the next couple of weeks? And I was really itching for a story. You know, I want some characters. I want a plot. I want some drama, maybe a goal, perhaps, or a, a dream to chase after, a pitfall, a struggle, maybe a triumph, maybe even a little celebration. And right now, I am reading the Bible with both my boys. Uh, we're reading the, the Bible at bedtime for each one of them. And uh, Dermot and I just read the story of Joseph. And I think it was from that that I decided, you know, I think that would be a good thing to study right now. So let's look at the life of Joseph for the next couple of weeks. But before we go forward, I always like to go back just a little bit, just to give you some background and some insight into the story that we are entering into. So we're gonna look at Genesis 30, verse 22. It says, then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. Joseph is the first son of Rachel and Jacob. Rachel is the girl that Jacob originally wanted to marry, but her father tricked him into marrying Leah, who was the older sister, and he ended up marrying Leah first. With Leah, he had six sons, and one daughter, but still no children with Rachel. In fact, Jacob had four other sons. He had two sons with Leah's servant Zilpah and two sons with Rachel's servant Bela. So that's 10 boys, if you're counting at home, 10 boys and one girl. But because Rachel was his beloved, it was his first love, his favorite wife, it was heartbreaking to both of them that they could not conceive. So when Joseph is born, he is born in Jacob's old age. And this birth sort of gives uh, Jacob this new lease on life. And so it stands to reason that uh, Jacob is especially favored of Joseph since Rachel is his true love and his mother. Genesis 37 says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made a robe for him of many colors. Now, of course, when your dad is the patriarch of the family, and he's the leader of this large clan, it's obvious if you are dad's favorite kid, even doubly obvious when you're the youngest. So what is up with this coat, right? Well, the truth is, we really don't know. Uh, I've seen some Bibles say that it was a coat with long sleeves. Other Bibles just say it was a special coat. Uh, why is it special? We don't have any idea. The Hebrew text here, they are words that we do not know how to properly translate. There are some theologians who are asking new questions, like what would a chieftain father of a tribe make? as a special little coat for his favorite son. What significant garment or coat would have made his other brothers jealous? Some are wondering if Jacob didn't wear a coat himself as the chieftain of the tribe, you know, that told other people that he was the leader, that he was the patriarch, that he is the leader and that's signified by this special garment. And then so as a special gift, he makes his son sort of like a, a mini-me coat that looks just like his. Hey, dad and I have matching coats. I can see this proud father doing that. You know, fathers who are in the military often get their sons or their babies, these little Kenny camo outfits. We kind of like to match. We say like father, like son, don't we? So what kind of slap in the face would it be if you have 10 sons who are older, who work for you out in the fields, who are loyal, who are obedient, who are good boys? 
But as soon as dad's other wife has a baby, you are forgotten. All dad cares about now is Joseph, spends time with Joseph. Why, he even made a little leadership coat for Joseph to wear, just like the one dad wears. How would that make you feel? Verse 4 says, But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. To belong to a family, a place where you should feel like you belong, like you're part of something, a place where you should always be accepted, but still always knowing in the back of your mind that you weren't totally on the inside, that you still had work to do to earn your father's love. And even if you worked hard, it wasn't enough. For whatever reason, dad just favored someone else. Your mom had a favorite and you secretly knew it wasn't you. All the other siblings have inside jokes and they get along so easily, but it never came easy for you. And these 10 older brothers, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, and Zebulun, they all live in Joseph's shadow for 17 years. Verse 5 says, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So what is this? What's going on here? Well, I guess it all depends on how you read it. But let's read it knowing all the facts. Joseph is 17, and he has 10 older brothers. Most of his brothers are strong, older, able-bodied men. I mean, think about this family for a minute. They're like a giant biker gang. These are tough guys, 10 sons, who live as shepherds out in the desert, one of the most hostile terrains on the planet. In fact, this has always been a family of boys. Jacob has a house of testosterone, doesn't he? This is a loud laughing, back slapping, grab a cold one when you get home from work kind of family. This is a family of dirty hands, pranks, dirty jokes, and beards. And then we got this 17-year-old mama's boy who doesn't work outside with the rest of them. He gets to play in the house with all the wives. He's sitting on daddy's lap and he's always wearing the pretty coat that daddy made for him. And then one day you see this kid walking out in the hot desert sun to you. And he says, hey, guess what? I had a dream that one day, not only would I be the head of household, but one day all you guys would worship me as a god. Okay, first of all, Reuben is the firstborn son. So all the inheritance of the family and land and wealth, those are his as birthright. And this is probably Reuben's biggest fear right now, that, that his dad would rewrite the will and just throw out tradition and make a special rule just for Joseph. But now this snot-nosed 17-year-old with clean fingernails and trimmed hair and no beard, never worked a day in his life, doesn't know the difference between a boy sheep and a girl sheep, has the audacity to say, not only will one day I rule this tribe, I will rule you as well. And then, and then, get this, he does it again. Verse 9, then Joseph dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers. Oh, Joseph, stop. Little man, oh, that's enough. Hit the brakes, brother. Nope. He said, behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? 
Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now, Joseph is bragging to his parents. He says, I don't even have to wait for you to die. I don't need to wait for a birthright or a will. One day, y'all will be my servants. Can you imagine the nerve of this kid? Even his own dad says, uh, not cool, Joseph. Maybe we don't talk like that in the big house. Verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flocks at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, here I am. So he said to him, go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he went from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Have you ever looked back on your life and you noticed One pivotal moment that changed everything. A chance encounter, a class you took, a teacher you had, a book you read, a place that you visited, something that you learned, some pivotal thing happened, something epic, something monumental, and it happened right here, right in these verses, this, this passage that we just read. Without that moment, there is no story of Joseph. Without that moment, there is no Moses. Without that moment, there is no Exodus. Did you catch the moment or did you miss it? The Bible says, and a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? A lone, unnamed person sees that Joseph is lost, and he says, I'm looking for my brothers. And the man said, oh, I saw them. They went that way. I feel like if this had been in the TV show, or if this had been in a movie, Joseph would have turned to thank the man, and it would have just been a cloud of swirling dust. The man would have disappeared. Because without this person, Without this unnamed person, the entire rest of the Bible doesn't happen. If Joseph had not found his brothers, he would have returned home. His brother's anger would have subsided and life would have gone back to normal. But sometimes something epic happens in our life. And at first, it might feel terrible, it might feel awful, It might feel like a trial or an experience that is unbearable. Verse 18 says, They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. It might feel just like that. It might feel like a trap a prison cell. It might feel like getting fired. It might feel like death. But no epic moment goes wasted in God's kingdom. No epic moment will go wasted in your life. Verse 21 says, but when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. You know, when we talked about anger a few weeks ago, we said that anger can be a good emotion. Oftentimes, anger is a very good motivator. 
especially when you are aware of an injustice. But anger, when it's mixed with jealousy, listen, jealousy is like a grenade. How early in life does a child learn to be jealous? Very early, right? The moment she gets a bigger cookie than you, or the moment that she got a pink dress for Easter and you got a yellow one. Jealousy does horrible things. Jealousy can wreck a relationship, wreck a marriage. It can cause a bitter rivalry at work, between families, between neighbors. It can lead to war. Jealousy is resentful and bitter and begrudging and envious and covetous. The jealousy you feel when someone else likes your man or your woman more than you think they should. The jealousy, jealousy you feel over a rival who gets that job or that position or the, or the custody rights that you wanted. The jealousy you feel because they have a better house or drive a nicer car or because they have more money than you. The jealousy you feel because they got preferential treatment over, over the, the color of their skin or because of their age or because of their gender. You know what I'm talking about because too many times we have been stung and hurt and betrayed and devastated by the jealousy that we feel in our hearts. And it's so strong and it just takes its grip on us and it makes us say things and do things that we know are wrong. We have to check ourselves. The core of jealousy, that seed of bitterness, when it's left unattended in our heart, it will grow. Look at these brothers. They are ready to kill their own kin, ready to kill their father's favorite son. That is until the eldest, Reuben, steps in. He offers an alternative. He says, whoa, 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 hold up. You know, we, we don't really have to kill him to make him go away. Let's just toss him into this pit. And, and what's the first thing they do? They rip that robe right off of him. That symbol of their father's favoritism. And then verse 25 says, and then they sat down to eat. And then they stopped for lunch? <laughs> that, don't you think that would have been awkward? <laughs> hey guys, are you still up there? Hello? Can I have a sandwich? But you know what's interesting? Sometimes when you do something wrong, or they say that, you know, people who commit a crime, they get this awful feeling in their gut. It's unsettled. And it makes, it's like a nervousness and you can't eat. So what's the Bible saying? They don't feel any guilt, right? No shame in this. They're glad it's over, happy to do it. Would do it again. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. This time, this time, murder was avoided. But what happened when Cain was jealous of Abel? The very first recorded family, brother killed brother over jealousy. What happens when the prodigal son returns home in Jesus' story? A story of two brothers and one father. The older brother was so jealous and, and he resented and rage was within him. He storms out of the, the party that his father is throwing and he yells at his dad. Those are only just two examples of jealousy and sin. But so often it, it, it reoccurs and it is the, it, it's the crux of history and the Bible and fable. 
Why should he be paid a million dollars a year and another five million in stock options? I'm just as good as they are. What, who does she think she is with her fancy clothes? And you, you know, she gets all that merchandise for free because she's on Instagram. What's the 10th commandment? What is the 10th commandment? Does anyone know? Don't covet, right? Don't be jealous. Why? Why not? Why is it so important that it's the 10th commandment? Well, let's talk about Joseph's life. Let's talk about Joseph's life. Why is the 10th commandment about jealousy? Wanting the life that other people have. Well, for one, jealousy never leads to anything good. You know, one of the worst traits of jealousy is that it strikes at the heart of your family or the people that are closest to you. People we know well and work with on a day-to-day -day basis, they end up being the source of jealousy. You say, I work like a dog for this company, and this guy, this guy just skates by, and he makes more than me. Can you believe it? He's got the boss wrapped around his finger, and I can't even get weekends off. Jealousy never leads to anything good. If Joseph's early life is this passive doting, you know, from his father, and if in Joseph's life maybe he even has an absent mother and a family that's filled with this deceit and jealousy and fighting, well, then the children are just left to figure it out on their own, just fend for themselves. But jealousy does not correct itself it's always gonna to lead to a greater and bigger problem. So what can we do about our jealous feelings? What should these 10 brothers have learned from their parents? Because, I mean, it would be nice if we could just shrug it off and forget about it and say, you know what, it'll go away. But let's look at three good points from another father and son. Let's look at King David and Solomon. They both have penned lots of scriptures and lots of advice about jealousy. Solomon says, jealousy will destroy your relationships. He writes in Proverbs 27, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Meaning what? The first two, he says, maybe you can handle it on your own. But jealousy, he says, watch out. If you begin to see the beginning seeds of jealousy planted in your soul, he says, you better fix it. David says, jealousy hurts you more. David writes in Psalm 37, never envy the wicked. Soon they fade away like grass and disappear. Trust in the Lord instead. Be kind and good to others. Then you will live safely here in the land and prosper. In other words, don't worry about the injustice when you see the wicked prosper. Don't worry. The Bible says God will do what is right. The Bible says it's not your job to worry. It's not your job to fix it. Don't be jealous. If it needs to be corrected, David says, God will fix it. And lastly, Solomon says, jealousy can ruin you of today. Jealousy can rob you of today. Solomon writes in Proverbs 14, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy rots the bones. What else can we learn from this story? Well, the other thing from this story that I think we can take away is perhaps the side of the story from, from Joseph's perspective. Because you see, his 10 brothers are jealous and they could have benefited from keeping that in check. We talked about that. But what's Joseph's problem? I'll tell you what his problem was. He was 17 and he was a punk. Well, <clears throat> well yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah but, but what's the bigger takeaway? I think the bigger takeaway is recognizing a God-sized dream when it's in your life. I think Joseph receives an amazing gift. 
He was given the gift of sight, and he was able to have these visions and interpret them. And not very many people have this special gift in the Bible, but the problem wasn't his dreams, and his problem wasn't the interpretation of them. Joseph's problem was how he reacts to his gift. He's cocky. He's arrogant. He's a braggart. He's a show-off. Have you had an enemy and and you thought to yourself, they're just jealous. They're just jealous of me. They're a hater because they're jealous. I can't help the fact that you're jealous. That may be, and jealousy is something that they will have to handle. But the flip side of that is our own humility, our own modesty. Are you really all that in a bag of chips? Are you the best? Great. Keep it to yourself. Tell me something. Where is your Ferrari parked? Ask yourself that next time. Next time you think somebody's jealous of you, ask yourself that question. Where did I park the Ferrari? Is it parked in your garage or your driveway? There's a difference. I can't help how they feel. Sure you can. Listen. Joseph has a legitimate dream, and it's factual, okay? It's an actual reason for him to be and to feel proud. One day, God's going to use him in a mighty way. He's going to save Egypt, save his family, save his people. And yes, one day, everyone will bow down to him. But Joseph can't separate the God-sized dream from his own self-centered fantasy. What's the difference? Well, a God-sized dream should lead to a life of purpose. A God-sized dream should give this person a taste of what's to come, to prepare him. But all Joseph can see is fame. All he can see is glory. And all the things that it's going to bring him, benefit him. Joseph's 17, and he's he's just a little too young to realize that a God-sized dream is not about him. God is going to use him one day in a very big way. What if it were you? What if it is you? How would you recognize the difference? Well, I think if it were a God-sized dream, it would be about God. Right? It would be about God and what God can accomplish. Yes, it involves you, but it's about what God can accomplish through you. And I also think it would be a clear mental picture of what could be, right? And it would be this conviction in your heart that this thing should be. A God-sized dream is a preferred future, and it stands in contrast of what is. A God-sized dream would imply movement needs to take place. But ultimately, someone is going to put their neck out and risk. Joseph is going to learn all of this in the years that follow. He's going to learn that God's dream for him is so much bigger than what he can even see. I don't know what God's dream is for your life, but I know this. It's bigger than you. It exceeds you. God's dream is bigger than you are. A fantasy is something that we force to make happen. It's dependent on our connections. It's dependent on our efforts. But a God-sized dream is not limited because it's made possible by God's connections. It's made possible by God's efforts. Maybe your life isn't going the way you thought it would. Maybe it's not going the way you thought it would go. And you don't understand what God is doing. My encouragement to you, my encouragement to you is to remain faithful, to be patient, to be obedient. Joseph's only 17. He's not patient right now. He, he has his entire life ahead of him. Be patient. 
Be faithful. Pray about it. Allow God to develop and shape your heart with love and compassion and, and, and allow God to give you eyes that see what he sees, grace and justice and forgiveness. Because at the end of the day, if we're settling for our own dream, our own fantasy, those things for our life that we are setting our own sights on, I'll, I'll tell you what, they're far too small, guaranteed. Your dream for your life is far too small. We have a chance to be a part of the continuing story that God is writing. If we are patient, if we are faithful, if we are obedient. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the life of Joseph. We thank you for the words, the scriptures that are recorded for us, that we might read them and learn from them. Continue to make them relevant and alive in our life, just as they were when they were written. Thank you for giving each one here a dream for their life. May we be able to separate our own goals from yours. And may we pursue a life of God-sized dreams. May we partner with you in something epic, something huge, something bigger than ourselves. Lord, we want to be a part of what you are doing. We want to join you where you are. We want to see the things that you see, love the things that you love, and have our hearts break for the things that break your heart. Lord, be with each one now as they go. Help us to remember to be the church each and every day until we all gather to meet again. Be with those in our church family who are sick, who have lost loved ones, and who need your tender touch. And if there's any way the church can be those things, Lord, continue to inspire us and encourage us. And we thank you for your good gifts and for everything precious in our life. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, be sure to take this link off of YouTube or wherever you found it, and you can put it to your own wall, share this message with others, uh, post it publicly, or share it with a friend who you think might benefit from it. Thank you guys. I love you. I'll see you next time. Bye.